So, a lot of you are um, overall electric vehicle enthusiasts and we're looking at uh, the speeds and what we can accomplish with the interaction and format. But what's really interesting is the alternative formats that are emerging, which is an industry I've been involved in since 2007. There are manufacturers now launching my own brand, uh, mostly in the Middle East and Europe and uh, Australia, and um, not entirely successful, but I, I've been working with the major gens in that for a couple of years. And I'm really excited about um, what they have planned and what we're doing since I joined them. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we're a headquartered here. Uh, initially, we call off the recently moved to Fremont because we're uh, expanding with the logistical center, which will distribute the products we're developing throughout the West Coast, uh, California, and Oregon. So let me tell you a little bit about that. But um, before, before I show you the vehicle, I wanted to explain the rationale for this vehicle, which I think is a key thing about it. I do have flyers and things uh, that I can distribute. Um, I'm sure some of you own our, all of you are very familiar with some of the excellent drive train technology and two wheelers. They're just um, being one, the brand one is here, obviously. I'm sure some of you own that. I'll see some motorcycles. So uh, this product is extremely different, uh, very, very different from that. And to um, explain what it is, well, we really started with a business plan, rather than Mahindra Jensen, because I probably knew this coming into to the company. But uh, one of the things we're aware of is that vehicle miles travel is it comes consistent decline, even on a per, you know, on a per capita basis in the United States. So we've been saturated in this aspect, and we're, we're now finding solutions out of that driving, especially in urban environments. If you look at who's driving less, Specifically, the answer appears to be younger people. They're delaying getting their driver's licenses. Um, they're moving to the cities. They're much happier living in the cities and using the um, transportation network available to them. And that's an amazing preference for living in those spaces. And uh, there's a 23% drop in vehicle miles traveled among the millennials. And that's a lot larger than the rest of the population. So clearly, this is a population, a popular population, a very large population, that requires some alternative solutions. Um, and and the you know, reasons why they're driving less, I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of this, but you know, unemployment, specifically among younger people, uh, urbanization. Uh, another important aspect is that the technology is preempting the need to commute. A lot of younger people, rather than getting in their car and driving to socialize with their friends, are what? Even not in the basement on the Xbox with their friends. <laughs> and, um, and that's the reality. A lot of us are commuting from home here. We don't drive to work. We do Massachusetts. What is, we said who here has a basement? Not many in California. Not in California. Oh, I've got one in Massachusetts. My son is socializing with his friends in the basement. And when he's 10 years older, instead of you know, for our generation of car had freedom. Mm -hmm. I got my license when I was 18. I'm yep. sure a lot of you did. Not no longer. 18. 16. 15. 15. Okay, I was in Europe. I mean, 16. 15 and a half, yeah. But, you know, for that, it's all. It's buying that cell phone. You can't have a cell phone. I have my friends who have this project of a laptop or gaming with my friends. It's freedom. Freedom is there. It's not the road anymore. So, um, and then if you want to look at research, um, for the first time since the 20s, growth in the cities is outpacing growth elsewhere in the country. Very unusual for the U.S. It's, it's almost like we're catching up to the rest of the world. And 62% uh, of millennials, according to a Nielsen study, said that they would rather live in urban centers than offer access to uh, their, their transportation network. And that's how they would choose where they live next. Um, you know, rather connect online than spend the time and money to drive. We just talked about that. And actually, we all say that, but millennials more so than older folks say that. And uh, having options also helps avoid driving. Again, yeah, for all of us, but more so than millennials. And that includes options include biking, walking, carpooling, anything that avoids driving a car in any format. Um, Share share models peer to peer of the Airbnb right? or business to consumer are um, just growing like crazy, and I would put the Google Buses into that category. It is 
an alternative, maybe get around the business as a lecture. So this is the economy, this is the infrastructure that we're, we're going to live with. Um, and lastly, it's not just the systems that are alternative to what we're used to, it's also the types of vehicles. You know, it doesn't all come in four wheels, it is a little bit more efficient. Too. When you have, you have a single person going from A to B, um, instead of using a four wheel you know, vehicle, you can accommodate them um, more efficiently with a single rider product. And you don't have to worry a lot about having, you know, finding a large space to park it. It's easier to operate. It becomes a reason for preference. Uh, and I think this increasingly is so. Um, how are the alternatives more efficient? Uh, this group doesn't need increasing, but you know, electric vehicles, electric becomes a logical choice. We'd like to see it succeed because it is clean and that's what we want to do, and there, there's lots of other reasons, but it, it is the logical choice in today's um, urban transportation you know, studies. Not because it's clean, but because it's efficient. It was maintenance free, you don't have to work, you know, find a gas station, you can park it anywhere. It just became, became very commercialized, commercializable and uh, popular because of other reasons. The challenges and barriers um, to you know, what we're doing, what the range of is doing, um, exist and they're very significant. One of them is that Americans are not a motorcycle culture. I took a look at um, how many people are on scooters in this country. I didn't have motorcycles, but compared to like France, China, and the Netherlands. And we have 40 times on a per capita basis, we have four to 40 times less likely to be on a scooter than is a Dutch person. I mean, that is a huge, huge uh, contrast. So Americans not being a two-wheeler culture, uh, there is a lot of investment and controlling and marketing required to convince them that this is something you can incorporate into your lifestyle. How do you do that? Um, some of the strategies should involve experiential campaigns. We need to get as many bucks on the seats and show them how easy it is to get to white card. And it feels extremely civilized, obviously, that that whole torque and you know, quiet experience on a two-wheeler, as is on a four-wheeler. Yeah, that's going to require a large company getting you know, paying for those bus to go on seats, because it's not going to happen through a niche dealer in infrastructure. I mean, look at what Tesla's been suffering from. I'm, there. I'm sure everybody's aware of their turmoil and they're trying to sell direct. Um, we're not going to sell through dealers, because it just doesn't make any sense in the electric vehicle world. We're not going to. It's not a matter of margin. Of course, we don't want to make it more expensive to consumers, but it's a matter of if you're a dealer and you have two, you know, two types of products to sell and one is a premium to the other, obviously you're going to try to sell the cheaper one. It's just easier when you have multi-brand strategy. And uh, when you're, you make a bulk of your income from maintenance expenses and your electric vehicle doesn't hardly require any or relatively small compared to internal combustion, that is, you, know, you may think it's exciting, you will put it in your assortment, but a year later you'll send them back and stop supporting it. That's what I've seen with vectors. Uh, I, I suspect that's what Elon Musk is thinking what happened to humans, right? So that's what managers to Gen Z is doing. The translation. You can't just be a company that pays to develop, technically develop these drive trains. You also have to pay for salespeople, or marketing people, the retail infrastructure. That's almost more expensive. Um, so a startup's not going to be able to do it. You need to along with infrastructure and financial backing. Please. Yes, yes, I think you have a point that was kind of uh, on the emergency. I love that, but I don't think so. Yeah. But, yeah I mean, there's no, you know, it's just, I would talk to you more about it in detail. It just doesn't make any sense. But I wish he was working with us. Yeah. 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 Let me ask you a question. How many examples are some of the pressures over here? And I don't know the exact number, but I know that they. Yes, of course. He's very successful and an excellent, excellent engineer. But um, when they had a recall, this is just public information a couple of years ago, 386 bikes for a recall. I mean, that's. How are you funding all this? If this is not a business, it's a niche. <laughs> if you're going to be a niche, you should love it. I think they're great. I have friends at each company. We can't bring it to the masses. We've got to figure out other ways to bring it to the masses. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, cost, obviously, there's a premium. Um, 
how do you the products are expensive? So if you're going to commercialize electric direction technology, we've got to think about formats that minimize how many batteries we put in them. What we should do, what Mahindra Jansi is doing, and I'm not saying this is the right answer, but for the only measure, that's what I'm trying to illustrate. Minimize the number of batteries, but also go and fix the problem where the problem resides in the urban centers. That's where the millennials are suffering, and that is going to be a great solution for campuses and city inner cities. So, because you don't need to go more than 30 miles, you're going to have a product that's very affordable. Uh, we're going to, we're retailing pre booking rather at $3,000 right now, which suddenly changes the plan. So, it changes how people can look at, you know, look at electric vehicle technology. Um, policy. No one supports anything that doesn't own the highway. <coughs> um, I have no idea what we're going to do about that, but we'll, we'll start with informing. Um, everybody will need to inform when we're starting to do that. Okay. And then infrastructure. We talked about the distribution challenges. We have to go direct. So, here's what we know. Um, this is the Mahindra Jansi, and I don't have a lot of information here about how we develop this, but I can talk to you about it. So the, the development of this product was started about two years ago, and we started with the business plan and the analysis, but that was quickly um, followed by the uh, design and engineering team that traveled in the United States, went to about seven or eight colleges, East Coast, West Coast, North and South, to do deep dives with groups of Students, that's who they started on at the time, who really understand the pain points of their daily transport. And they talk specifically with consumers, uh, sorry, students who live on campus versus off campus, a little bit you know, different um, types of needs, need profiles, and then um, it's called voice of consumer research. So the form factor looks like a scooter and it is classified as a moped. But the starting point was not really within the constraints of let's go do a two wheeler. It, it could be something else that would not have exercise. So we don't call it a scooter. We call it that, you know, we, we say to people when they ask us, you know, this is um, a smartphone, you know, this is to scooters as a smartphone is to, you know, rotary phones. And the way we explain it is it'll carry, it's designed to carry a rider and their stuff. Whoever commutes anywhere without their stuff. Everybody has to go you know, grocery shopping, you can do that on a laptop. We can bring those in the, uh, in the near cargo area. It looks like a crossover product. So uh, you can also charge your laptop as you're traveling. It really works with the millennial and, and other lifestyle. And that was, that's the first point of difference is the functionality and the utility. Second point is that it is completely no hassle. Obviously, electric is no hassle, so by definition, it is electric. But also, um, we have put in a uh, removable battery pack. It's going to look somewhat like that, and uh, you'll be able to see that on Saturday or Sunday if you can come and join us for the test runs. And it's about 20 to 20, 25 pounds, we'll finalize that. So it's quite portable if you need to say take it to a 15-story uh, apartment or an office. It's a hundred and ten volt wall output. Is the charger built into the battery? Yes. Charger was we actually initially considered putting the motor controller in there, it was getting too heavy, so we took it out. But the uh, cells and the you know charger are in there. And oh I see the picture's not showing up. Um, it's also going to become a smart car, a smart uh, vehicle. So you a lot of cross drive cars with lots of connectivity. Uh, that's the direction this is headed in the, in the November launch this end of this year. We're going to have some apps that uh, work with the product and I can get into more detail if you have questions later. But eventually, the image touch screen monitor that is the speedometer right now is going to be a connected. It's going to make this a connected device. So that's, that's our goal. We want to look at that as a whole platform to do And we want to um, plug into efforts with smart cities and whatnot so we can track some of this urban transport data and uh, help with um, the urban planning and state management. Please. Uh, is that the largest uh, portion of the world? Yes, it is and it is. It does. As far as your connectivity to the console, so uh, you can take a look at the uh, stronger SP2. Yeah. And the carry, well, it's our electric bicycle, but it has lots of connectivity. Very nice, yeah. From your cell phone to the cloud, 
that was turning that up, although it's really cool. Um, another one um, was e social life out of Europe. Mm -hmm. Anyway, people are catching on. There's a lot of opportunity there. Please. Is it a touch? Is that your question? There is a touch screen, yeah. It's the you know, incoming shield facing the writer. In front of you, you're writing on the handlebars. It's horizontal with an incline facing the face of the writer. Yeah. Okay, right. So, good, good question. We're very concerned about that, so we're going to implement controls when we get to that level of connectivity. Right now, the touch screen, I'll show you what it does. Um, some of the formatting that we translate. So, what it does is it shows you, um, it has a down there speed, energy consumption, battery status, estimated range. Um, so, it has just regular controls right now that you can access while you're writing. Uh, and when we incorporate connectivity, we're going to control those in writing mode. So, we're not going to allow everything when you're, in, when you're moving. So, a couple other things about the vehicle is that it has an element of exoskeleton. There was a lot of design work that went into their preferences, design preferences of millennials. And it was developed to be very minimalistic. Also, what that exoskeleton does is there is no frivolous plastic parts in there, except for a few components that you need to you know, use plastic for. If you drop it, nothing happens. It makes it a perfect thing. You know, very, very sturdy, uh, very durable, very strong. Uh, you know, and it just looks, looks cool. It looks, it looks familiar when the Honda Rap is here. Honda Rap is here. Yeah, it's, it's kind of got that you know, skeleton outward. You know, if you have nothing to hide, you know, look, but you get in a minimalistic way. So they are ready for test rides next weekend. And Wes has the email. Uh, if anybody wants to schedule a test ride, we just, they just need to email that um, person and then skip through this page. This, the, um, Okay, he's not showing. Uh, the top speed is 30 miles per hour. We're capping it there because in a lot of states, uh, that means you don't need a license. In California, you do. It requires an M2 license. It will go 30 miles in our internal testing. We reached 37. That, that was not an urban cycle, the 30 mile range. But I, I'm just trying to tell you that's pretty comfortable for us. Uh, it does come in three modes to you know, limiting torque to uh, sport mode, which is unlimited. Economy to maximize range. There's also an easy mode. It's really a safe mode for now. This is like for a test ride or something. It's not going to be used very often. Um, very decent acceleration, as you would expect. And uh, we have 18650 cells, 1.6 uh, watt our nominal um, battery capacity. So at least these are on our website if you want to go to see them, obviously. Let's see, we've, uh, we're testing the battery life cycle, but we're comfortably uh, at 800 cycles right now. So we're going to be warranting the vehicle for three years. Please. Can you buy the battery, a uh, spare battery? You can, yes. We're trying to price that out, and the recommendation is to not add any profit to it, obviously, which the company seems to have accepted, and we'll be finalizing that soon. I think it'll be about 1200 I mean, the, the, the is just crazy enough, so I don't know how to proportionalize those two things for you. It's about 25 pounds. It may be a little bit different than that. Um, again, we have um, a heavy assembled unit. I'm sorry? It includes the charger. It includes the charger, yeah. 168,000, yeah. So, uh, the generator braking, you know, that's really it. Um, oh. The last but probably the other question.
I agree with that. When you look at the vectors, and what's really interesting is um, I've seen people sell on those. Too, so I don't know. Um, and that it really increases the price point a little bit. I, I, in principle, yes. I don't know that anybody does a good job of that yet. And it's a real lot, right, when you're very low. Yeah. 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 The trick is not that too. They finally went on again recently, but um, yeah. So one very interesting thing. This should be the last piece I would cover. Is the live Mahindra? Have, have you heard of Mahindra? Has anybody heard of Mahindra? Oh, a lot of you have. Okay, this is not typical in the U.S. So for those of you who haven't, um, it's a large $17 million Indian code opera. Competes with Tata and Mana. And in the United States, they, they've been here for a long time, uh, especially with the tractor business out of Houston, Texas, Houston. And they have a technical injury division here in the Bay Area. They have teams in some of the major companies in right in Silicon Valley that do a lot of work. And it's, it's almost like a low profile company that's going to hit the market that doesn't. And they're being very strategic about how you would come and establish your brand over here because it's, it's driven by a very somewhat an altruistic goal. They want to be one of the 50 most admired companies in the world in the next few years. To do so, America is on that next frontier for them. Large market, they don't really have that brand recognition besides tractors, which, you know, unless you're a farmer, then they don't want that. So, how do you enter a market where you could really be coming with a greater brand presence? They have, uh, they own Samyong in Korea, they own Riva car, electric cars uh, in Europe, very well known in the UK. Uh, they have an aerospace business, so there's a lot that could be coming to the US. So if you're smart, you're planning strategically on a product that appeals to millennials, that is cool, and that is playing in the juxtaposition of sustainability and uh, high technology. I think the millennial is a very good, the Gen product is a very good match for their investment. And uh, I'm grateful as someone who really needs to see the stuff see. Uh, this is more than a job, obviously. Yes, it is more than a hobby for all of you. And because we needed somebody at that caliber and discipline to pay not just for the engineering development, all of this is integrated uh, at the low start in our team in Michigan. All of this was developed uh, by us, not off the shelf. Uh, but they are also undertaking the distribution, you know. So we can go do this the right way and really control how we build the brand and sell to consumers. We get lots of seats. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to start to be delivered by the end of this year. We've been selling them on our e-commerce site and uh, we have an experience at our call up on University Avenue. This is based here and it's only going to be sold in California and Oregon because we want to test. We're testing various approaches when it comes to marketing distribution sales. And we're going to optimize as we roll out to the rest of the country and we're going to prioritize areas where we can go direct. Yeah, that's actually going to the 
You can go on a lot of these to be millennial. Well, interestingly, that's how we develop this product. Like when we do research, we run quantitative research and we look at it like normalized population by ages. We want to see by everybody. I think that's going to be our initial marketing factor, but it's not going to remain as a millennial product. I think you're going to like it as much as you know my 16 year old. I think you did. And based on research, yeah, it's well received by any age group. Yes, 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 so yes, yes. Thank you for asking that. I should have mentioned it. So it's keyless. You enter the touch screen monitor with your um, code, just like you would on a uh, smartphone. And that's that's not number one feature. Number two, you can take the batteries with you the product cannot be. And we are selling standard bike locks for cities, so you can secure this thing to wherever you park it. Do like a bicycle, you know, they do it through. Yeah, yeah, Yes, we're talking to Stanford University about developing exactly that. And some of our app ideas, which probably will be ready by the launch, incorporate some. Did you say that we tonight? Yeah, I'm saying that right now. Okay. Right now. <laughs> yeah, and, and what you mentioned, your question is a key um, point for our target audience, and that's the, one of the quite few concerns. Watch me. Yes, There's a small pack, yeah. Yeah. the pack to the motor so that if you somebody puts a different pack down there, you know what they're doing. I just saw that I got distracted. Yeah, they use it my time.
Talk to Terry. Terry knows more about this than I do. Terry put a motorbike motorcycle helmet in his hand. Right there. Long guy. There he is. <laughs> Edit page, you better save first.